Hello, thanks for watching. We're going to be looking at setting up a development environment for the Odin project on the Windows operating system. So if we take a quick look at the foundation section of the uh, Odin project curriculum, we'll see that it uh, starts off with an introduction section and then goes on to an installation section. We're going to be jumping in here at the installation section, but if you've uh, just started the Odin project, it's uh, best if you go back and and complete the introduction before you move on. Uh, just do these um, six topics, including any of the tasks that they ask you to do, um, <clears throat> and then you can move forward to the installation uh, section. One of the um, key differentiators for the Odin project is that they recommend that the best way to set yourself up for long-term success is to operate in a real development environment. So they go to great, great pains when they go through this installation section to make sure that you're set up the correct way. Now in relation to the supported operating systems, uh, the Odin project supports Unix-like operating systems. So if you've got a Mac or if you've got a Linux, then everything will be fine. Actually, if you have got Linux, the uh, documentation specifically refers to Ubuntu um, as their operating system of choice. However, if you've got Windows, um, please note that Windows is not natively supported by the Odin project. And if you're in their Discord server, um, they're not going to um, uh, support, support Windows uh, issues at all. Their recommendation if you do have Windows is to install a Linux virtual machine or to set up a dual boot system in order to keep your Windows while creating your development environment in Linux. Now if you do install the virtual machine or the dual boot setup you will indeed have a graphical Linux environment to develop in but the option that I'm going to talk about today, a third option for the Windows um, operating system, is called the Windows subsystem for Linux. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But do remember that any kind of Windows um, installation, whether you're talking native Windows or um, WSL, they're not going, the Odin project is not going to support it. Windows Subsystem for Linux is um, already distributed uh, with Windows. It's obviously best to have the latest um, updates to the operating system because WSL um, uses some virtualization in the background. Um, so make sure that your Windows is updated to the, to the latest version. And the WSL lets developers run a Linux environment directly on the Windows unmodified without the overhead of a, of a traditional virtual machine or dual boot setup. So it doesn't take that long to set the WSL up. We'll just follow through this uh, tutorial here on the best practices for setup. And all you need to do is um, grab a PowerShell or, or the Windows command prompt, doesn't matter either one, and um, uh, run a command. So we're going to be using the uh, plain old command shell. We run that as administrator because we need to make some changes to the system. And we just have to uh, run the command WSL minus minus install. Now at this point the install command enables um, a few uh, optional parameters and components in Windows. It will download and install the latest Linux kernel. It does set the WSL version to version 2 as default um, and just uh, remember this because we'll uh, come back to this in, in just a moment. And it then goes to the net and downloads and installs the Ubuntu Linux distribution. After that um, download uh, a reboot will be required. So we'll get to that in a second. The um, Ubuntu is now 15% downloaded, so I won't bother waiting around online for that. Uh, I'll come back um, when the download has finished. Great, the download has finished, and it's uh, telling us to reboot the system, so we'll go ahead and we'll do that. 
So Linux has re sorry, Windows has rebooted, and uh, it went immediately into installing the Ubuntu. However, in my instance, I have this particular error. Now I know what this error is. It's uh, because I'm or well, my Windows install is actually a virtual machine, and WSL version two, uh, which was automatically set when uh, when when you install WSL, doesn't particularly like that. So I know that the way around this is to reset my WSL back to version 1. Now in your instance, if you're just installing WSL on your Windows laptop or your Windows desktop, then you shouldn't um, get this issue. However, if you do get um, some issues, you can go to the WSL troubleshooting uh, documentation and in here you can search for the error codes um, or um, just have a general read through on uh, where you think that um, you might be having some issues and hopefully you'll be able to uh, troubleshoot your way through that. So I'm going to uh, go ahead here and reset my uh, WSL back to version 1. I can do that in a command prompt as the administrator and all I need to do is set default version 1 and that should uh, fix my problem. So now that I've done that I can uh, rerun the Ubuntu install and we'll uh, see what happens then. The installation has progressed and after a few minutes it's um, asked us to enter a Unix username. Now this username is totally unrelated to your Windows username. This is your username for your uh, Linux, your Ubuntu. So the best um, username to use is, uh, is one word, uh, lowercase. Just keep it simple. In my instance, uh, my username can be Tony. It will ask you for a password. Now when you're typing a password into a um, Linux terminal, you won't see any of the characters echoed back as you type them. You won't see any dots or dashes or asterisks, but um, be aware it is recording your keystrokes. So I'll put in my password. It asks you to um, retype your password for verification. And if you get it right, it will tell you that your password has been updated successfully. It will go through and um, present you with uh, a few bits of diagnostics, including this, um, this important line here that says to run a command as an administrator, you can use the sudo command. Uh, but um, I'll get to talking about some of these command line uh, things that you can do in a little while. But uh, for the moment, what we have installed now is the, um, is the WSL and we've installed a Ubuntu operating system and here is the Linux terminal that you can work in. If you wish to exit from your um, Linux terminal all you have to do is type exit and return and the terminal will go away. If you want to start your terminal again you can select uh, Ubuntu from your application menu and your terminal will restart again in your home directory as the user that you have set before. So we'll just close our terminal again and we'll go back to the Odin project curriculum and back to the installation section and move on with the next topic. After the introduction section uh, there are instructions on how to install Linux as a virtual machine or how to install Ubuntu and Windows as a dual boot, but we're not going to do either of those because we're following the WSL method. Following is a requirement to install Google Chrome. Now you only need to do this if you don't have Google Chrome on your Windows desktop. We're not going to be installing um, Chrome in Linux or Mac OS. We're going to be running all our uh, graphical applications for the Odin project development environment uh, directly on Windows. So I'll go ahead now and um, download and install um, Google Chrome. Download Google Chrome. 
and that's what we need so I'll go ahead and download that in the background and then I'll be right back great Chrome is installed I have a um, shortcut here on my desktop and we'll move along to the next topic this section contains the instructions for installing your text editor or code editor and as the introduction says the text editor is by far the most used developer tool regardless of what type of developer you are now the Odin project uh, recommends Visual Studio Code or VS Code as the uh, code editor so we're going to install VS Code um, onto our Windows system we won't be installing it on uh, Linux or Mac OS so <clears throat> VS Code is a Microsoft product and uh, we'll just uh, get VS Code and I will be uh, right back after I have installed VS Code on my Windows. Excellent, VS Code has been installed. I have an icon on my desktop because I enabled that option while the install was going through. But right now I'd like to revisit the WSL documentation because there is a special section in here regarding uh, set, uh, setting up VS Code with WSL and uh, what it suggests that we do is to install this special remote development extension pack uh, which will assist with the um, integration of VS Code and WSL. On that uh, website all we have to do is um, select install and uh, open uh, Visual Studio Code and then we can continue with the install from within here. That should take uh, just a moment to to do the installs and you can see that there's been several things installed here and uh, the uh, installation has uh, now been successful we're finished now with our WSL configuration so I'll close this tab off we can go back to our Odin project curriculum and move on with the next lesson so this is Linux command line basics. I'm sure this uh, topic will bring the most joy to Windows users. I won't be following this section through. Uh, that's up to you. Instead, what we're going to do is um, review how we can use Windows and the Linux command line together. In order to bring up our Linux terminal, you can find that on your start menu applications and it's um, simply called Ubuntu or Ubuntu on Windows and this will bring up our Linux terminal. You don't need to use Control alt t as suggested by the Odin project. This is only needed if you're running a graphical Linux desktop but we're running um, uh, WSL so this is not relevant so I this particular instruction here where they tell you that you can open the programs menu and search for terminal and um, and um, open it by pressing control alt T on your keyboard is um, not relevant for us at all so you don't need to use that at all so when we first open our terminal or every single time we open our terminal for that matter I'll just demonstrate that again if we're not in our terminal and we open our uh, Linux terminal it will always come up the same way here the first thing it does is uh, remind you that if you need to run commands as the administrator or the root user uh, you have to use the uh, sudo command before the command that you wish to run but uh, that's not important for us at the moment so um, you can simply ignore this line but uh, do keep it in the back of your mind because you will come across that at some point so when you've opened up your terminal you'll find yourself in the uh, Linux home directory and this can be read from the prompt here you can see your username at the machine that you are on and this after the colon is the directory or the folder that you are in this particular machine name is whatever you've named your Windows computer. In my instance, it's called Vungtau. Vungtau just happens to be a, um, a seaside city in Vietnam where I uh, enjoyed staying for quite some time. So 
I tend to label all, all my computers after um, interesting cities I've visited. In this instance, Wungtau. So Tony is my username at Wungtau, the computer, and I am located in my home directory. Now, Windows also has a user home directory, but it is not the same location as your Linux home directory. Okay, your Windows home directory is this one here and it contains these folders and things. Now if you don't have this particular icon on your desktop which represents your home directory you can find that by clicking uh, uh, the right mouse on any space on your desktop go to personalize go to your themes and in your themes you can select the desktop icon settings and in here you can turn on and off some of these additional icons that I have down here. So I've turned on my computer icon, which is this. I've turned on my users files, which is my home directory. I've turned on my network, which is this. And I've turned on my recycling bin. You can turn on your control panel if you want, but I don't use that very much, so I don't tend to, um, to turn that on. So this users files represents your home directory icon, which you can turn on for your desktop. And here is a, uh, my home directory on my Windows computer containing all these files and folders, but it is not the same as my Linux home directory. Often you will hear me referring to folders and directories, but in reality they're exactly the same thing. Most uh, Windows users will, recommend, uh, will recognize the term folder uh, because that's uh, the icon representation uh, in the desktop. So these things are folders. But in the Linux world, they're mostly referred to as directories. But in reality, they're exactly the same thing. So I will probably use the terminology. Uh, either way, I'll sometimes refer to them as folders and sometimes refer to them as directories, but they are the same thing. Other interchangeable terminology includes application and command. I'm sure that Windows users are more familiar with the terminology application, but uh, Linux users um, will refer to applications as running a command on the command line. So command and application, I'll probably use those uh, terms interchangeably as well. So let us take a closer look at our uh, Linux home directory. We uh, have had a quick review of this prompt here, which is our username at our machine name, and the section after the colon is the working directory that we are currently in. Now, I didn't uh, point out very well that this symbol here after the colon is actually a, um, a tilde, but I don't think you can see it very well because of the color scheme. The tilde is the uh, little squiggly line that you find um, above the quote and below the escape key. So this particular um, symbol on the Linux command line represents the home directory. Okay, And if we want to actually get a complete representation of what the directory is that we're currently in, we can type this uh, Linux command here called PWD, which stands for Present Working Directory. So if I type the command PWD, present working directory on the command line and hit enter, it's going to tell me precisely what the directory is where I'm located. In this instance, I'm located in the slash home slash Tony directory, and that is my home directory on the Linux computer. So let's say we want to see what's in our home directory. On Windows, we can open this folder and we can see the other folders and files that are in our home directory. On the Linux command line, we have to run a command to do the same thing. In this instance, the command is ls, which stands for list or list files. So if we type ls and hit enter, we will see absolutely nothing. And that's because on a brand new uh, Linux install, there is nothing in your home directory. The files and applications that are needed to run a Linux computer are in other directories. Your home directory is empty. 
Now, how do we get to see our Linux files from our Windows desktop? The answer is simple in that when you install the WSL, it enabled Linux to be able to search for Windows applications by integrating the Windows folders that included the Windows applications into the path that Linux will search in order to run applications. So if we consider um, a Windows application that you may be familiar with called Notepad, if we type notepad.exe on the Linux command line, it will open up the Windows Notepad for us. Likewise, if we want to view files on the Linux um, file system, we can run the Windows Explorer executable. However, notice in this instance, if I just type explorer.exe, it's going to bring up the Explorer uh, with, a, with a default setting of, of show me the quick access files, but we don't want that. We want the Explorer to be able to see the files in our Linux home directory. So what we need to be able to do is type explorer.exe and give it the path that we want the Explorer to open in. In this instance, it's simply a dot, which means the current working directory where I am. So if we type explorer.exe space dot, it's going to open up the Windows Explorer in our Linux home directory. Ah, but what are all these files you ask in the uh, Linux home directory? When we looked at our home directory using Linux, it was uh, an empty directory, and we can prove that. Here we are in our Linux home directory, we type ls, and there's nothing there. Well, I sort of lied a little bit, because what's actually in the Linux home directory is this selection of files, and uh, also a folder, and some files, but you will notice that each of the files and folder names begin with a dot. And a dot in Linux, in a file name, at the beginning of a file name, sorry, only at the beginning of a file name, means that that file is hidden from view from the normal ls command. That's because there, it'll just clutter up the, um, the output of the ls command because you don't really need to see these files all the time. Uh, they're just part of the configuration. So if I type ls, I don't get to see any of these hidden files. However, if I do wish to see those hidden files for some reason, I can add a switch to my ls command which will show them to me. In this instance, the switch is minus a, which stands for all files. So if I type ls minus a, lo and behold, I'll see all my hidden files that begin with the dot. Now viewing the file output, um, the files output like this is a little bit difficult to see. So there's yet another switch that we can use with ls that makes our um, output look a little bit more reasonable. And that's the minus l switch, which stands for long. So if we type ls, minus a so that we can see all the hidden files, minus l so that we get a long output, we see all our files listed uh, with, with more details. Now these detail, the, the, these part of the details aren't necessary to know much about at the moment, but I will tell you that um, this section here relates to the permissions on the file. This section here uh, belongs to um, uh, outlines who owns the file and what group owns the file. This is the file size and this date represents the last time that the file was modified and here is the file name. If we want to make our command more compact we can join the uh, switches together and we can type, uh, type the command ls, combine the switches by using um, al and we'll get exactly the same detailed response. So to summarize the few things we've just done, uh, we've talked about using the uh, ls command with some switches in order to view the uh, output of our files in the Linux command. We've talked about how the WSL integrates the Linux path in order to be able to run Windows applications in Linux. And we've discussed how we can use the 
Windows Explorer.exe file in order to list the files um, that we have in our Linux home directory as a uh, window on our Linux desktop. So now we'll just have a quick look at uh, tab completion and what that means is that when you start typing a command on the Linux desktop, so long as you have enough characters in the command for Linux to be able to recognize, if you then type the tab key, it's going to complete the command for you to the best of its knowledge. In some instances, if you haven't typed enough uh, letters, it might um, uh, give you more options that you can choose from. But if you do type enough characters and hit the tab key, it will um, complete the command for you and then you just have to add the extra bits and pieces that you want, hit the enter key and it will bring up um, the Windows command for you. Let's start creating some folders. We might close this particular Windows Explorer because we already have one opened in the background. I think we'd run the, um, the um, explorer.exe command twice so we had two of the Explorer windows open. So we're going to first of all uh, create a, a folder in our Linux home directory from our Windows Explorer. So that's fairly simple. You simply right click and create a new folder and we're going to call this folder our test folder. Hit enter and there's our test folder. So you can imagine now back in our Linux home directory if we type ls we're going to see our test folder. Now the reason why we didn't see all of our other files in here, all of our hidden files, was because we didn't use the minus A flag. We simply use the ls, which is going to show us all the folders and files that are in our home directory. And we could indeed see all of this combined. If we type ls minus A, we're going to see all of our hidden files plus our test folder. Or we could type our ls minus LA, and we're going to see all of our hidden files plus our test folder in long format. So most of the time you won't be using the minus A switch, you could simply type ls minus L and we're going to see our test folder. So we've created our directory uh, from the Windows Explorer. Now we're going to see how we can create a directory in Linux. So here we are in our Linux home directory. The command to create a directory is mkdir, which stands for make dir space, and then we give it the directory name that we'd like. So we're going to call this test2 folder. Hit enter and our folder has been created. In order to see it we can type ls minus l. So now we can see test folder created from our Windows um, desktop and we can see test2 folder which we've just created from our Linux command line. If we go back to our Explorer we can't see the test2 folder at the moment. That's because we need to refresh the Windows window. And we can now see that we've got our test2 folder and our test folder. That just jumped around there for the moment because uh, it wanted to organize our files um, by alphabetical order. Now that we've created our folders or directories, how can we change into them? With uh, Windows Explorer, it's, uh, they're just like any other folder. We can simply double click and go into our folder. This one is currently empty because we haven't put anything in there. We can go back, we can go into our test folder. It's also empty. If we want to do the same thing on the Linux command line, we have to use our, uh, our change directory command. And the change directory command for Linux is simply cd. So we cd into the directory we would like to go to. So let's try the test folder, hit enter, and we're in the test folder. Notice that the prompt has now changed because we have changed directory. The beginning of the prompt will always stay the same. It's uh, your username at your, machine, at your machine name, but after the colon, it is now showing that we have moved to the home directory slash test folder. If we have a look around, uh, 
to see what's in this folder. As expected, we can type ls-l and there's no, no files in there. We haven't done anything yet. In order to go back up to the parent folder, so we don't want to be in the test folder anymore, we want to go back up to our home directory, there's two ways of doing this. Initially, we could just type cd space dot dot. Now, what dot dot means is to go to the parent of the current directory you are, you are in. You don't have to type any names or anything. So we can hit cd space dot dot. We go back up to the home directory. So let's go through this process again because I want to demonstrate something else. We go back into our test folder, uh, hit enter. We're in our test folder. We can see that because it's changed the prompt. If we want to go back to our home directory from anywhere on the Linux system, we can just type cd and hit enter. That's a shortcut for please take me to my home directory. So we type cd and we're back in the home directory. We'll try it again. We'll go to the test2 folder and hit enter. Have a look around. Nothing there. Go back home. Now typing that long command can be a little bit of a nuisance. So as we talked about before, I could cd type a little bit of the command, hit the tab key, and notice it stops after test. It's because it can't think how much further to go, because we've got two folders in there, one called test folder and one called test2 folder. So the unique characters that Linux rec uh, recognized was up to the end of the test. If we hit tab again, it's going to tell us our options. So we can either go to the test2 folder or we can go to the test folder. In this instance, I can just type the F because I want to just go to the test folder, hit tab, it's going to complete the command for me. I hit enter and there I am. CD back home. If I wanted to go to the test2 folder, I could type CD TE, hit tab, it's going to go to the end of test, type 2, hit the tab, hit enter, there I am. And I can go back home again. So far so good. We've talked about creating directories in uh, Windows and in Linux. We've talked about how to refresh our Explorer so that we can see those directories. We've talked about how we change directory into the directories that uh, we create. And we've talked about how, the, how we can change back to our home directory from anywhere on the Linux system. Right now we're going to talk about how we can create files on our Linux file system. Mostly this will be done when we're uh, using Visual Studio Code or we can create them directly from the command line. Let's do that now. We will change to one of our folders. Let's go to the test folder. So we go CD, TE, tab, F, tab, enter. And we're in our test folder. The simplest way to create a file is to use the Linux touch command. And the way we use that is to type the command touch space and the name of the file that we would like to create. So in this instance, let's, uh, let's create a text file and we'll call it test.txt. Hit enter and our file has been created. How do we know that? We can type ls-l and we'll see that our file has been created here. It's actually not called test.txt because I made a typo and called it text.txt. So what we can do now is introduce another Linux command MV, which stands for move, or uh, Windows users uh, might know it as rename. So we can use the move command to correct our typo here by typing MV move. We want to move the text.txt file to be test. I was just about to make the same mistake again. Test.txt file. Enter. Now if we have a look around, ls-l, we'll see that our file has been renamed from text to test. Now we can open our Windows Explorer in the current directory, hit enter, and here is the test file that we created. Windows recognizes this as a text document because we used the .txt file extension. So if we double click on this um, test file in the Windows Explorer, it will open it in Notepad because Windows uses Notepad to open files that it recognizes as text document. 
So now we've looked at creating a file using the touch command. We've looked at how to rename it using the move command. And then we've looked at how we can see the files that we've created in the Windows Explorer. What we can do now is move on with how to remove the files and folders that we no longer need. In uh, Windows Explorer, this is, uh, as you usually would, right click on the file and select delete. Yes, we don't want that anymore. We can go to our Windows Home Directory, which is, um, sorry, our, our Linux Home Directory in the Windows Explorer. We can see our two folders that we created, and let's say we don't want the uh, test two folder anymore. So let's um, delete that, shall we? We right click and delete, and the folder has gone. So all we're left with in our Linux home directory now is the test folder. We can prove that by going back to our home directory in Linux using the cd command and we can have a look around with ls-l and we can indeed see that all we have left is the test folder. On the Linux command line the way to delete files and folders is to use the remove command. So we need a file to remove first of all. So let's cd into the uh, test folder. Let's create a file using the touch command and we'll call this test.txt again. Now, if we wish to uh, delete or remove this file, it's simply a matter of typing the command rm and the file that you wish to remove. In this instance, test.txt. Hit enter, have a look around, and you'll see that there's no files remaining. So we now go back to our home directory we have a look around again, we see we still have the test folder and now we'll, uh, we'll get rid of that. However, if we use the rm command to try to remove a folder, we will get an error because it says that um, the test folder is a directory. In order to use the rm command to remove a folder, we have to add an extra switch which is rm-r for recursive and then we add the name of the folder. So in this instance, rm-r, test folder, and it's gone. We can have a look around in our home directory, and now it's clean again. I think we've covered quite a significant amount of uh, command line for the Linux terminal. So I was going to have this bonus section where I looked at another command called history, but I think um, we've done enough. So let's just um, close our notepad and exit from our uh, Linux terminal shell by using the exit command. Let's go back to our um, the Odin project curriculum and we will skip over this command line section and go on with the next lesson. This is all about setting up Git. So far we have installed two additional applications, Google Chrome and VS Code, and they're installed on our Windows. However, Git will be the first application that we install completely on Linux, and um, we will be using the command line only to control Git. It won't be a graphical application at all. To take a quick look at what Git is, it's described here as a very popular version control system. I would probably go as far as to say it's possibly the most popular version control system. You'll be using Git um, quite a lot during your uh, TOP journey. So um, don't worry too much about understanding it right now because you'll be getting uh, lots of practice as you go through the course. <clears throat> so with Git, you can track and save the history of all the changes that you make to files. So in, in that way, it's uh, very useful for working in a collaborative environment because um, many different uh, groups of, de of developers can be working on the same code base, but on different parts of that code base, and Git will manage to keep it all organized for you. So let us move on with the actual installation. We can follow through the uh, Linux um, instructions here because we're installing it on our Linux system. And the first thing that we should do prior to installing any uh, new software is to make sure that our Linux system is up to date. So in order to do that, 
we need to run these two commands. Now I know these look fairly cryptic, so I've prepared uh, some notes concerning these um, commands so that we can have a better idea of what they do. The first part of our command is sudo. Now what sudo means is that you can run a command or an application with administrator privileges because the command that you're running may affect the security or the integrity of your Linux system. So as a matter of fact sudo is simply shorthand for super user do. So sudo simply uh, elevates your privileges to install new software. The actual command that we're running is called apt and what apt stands for is advanced packaging tool. So packages uh, are the Linux equivalent of individual applications and their um, supporting files and configurations. These are all wrapped up in what's called a package and you download uh, an application as a package of files that then gets uh, implemented onto your Linux system. Now to bring the Linux uh, completely up to date we need to run two commands. The sudo apt update followed by a sudo apt upgrade. Now what update does is fetches a list of the available software versions uh, as they stand at the time and what upgrade does is to download and install the latest version according to what update has found. So we'll go ahead now and uh, update our Linux system. We'll open up our Linux command line. wait for our prompt to appear and then we can type these two commands sudo apt update it will ask for your password at this point because um, you need to prove to the system that uh, you have the rights to uh, request the administrator privileges so you need to enter your password and hit enter and then apt will go out onto the net and find the latest version of all the packages that are installed on your system. This part of the update normally doesn't take too long. It just has to uh, search through a few indexes and uh, get the information that it needs. and we can see here from this diagnostic that it's found 256 packages that can be upgraded. Now the reason why there is so many that can be upgraded is because when we did the WSL installation and uh, WSL went and uh, got our uh, Ubuntu operating system it was probably just an old uh, packaging made by Microsoft some time ago so Ubuntu has been updated since then and it has found a lot of packages on your system 256 in my instance here that can be upgraded so we'll go ahead now and uh, run the upgrade command which is uh, sudo apt upgrade press enter now this will take a long time because it's got to download a lot of packages, 300, um, 168 meg of archives it's going to go and get and then it has to install all those packages on the system and upgrade everything and it's uh, eventually going to increase the amount of space that it requires on your system by 300 megabytes, that's neither here nor there. So it's asking us do we want to continue, our answer is going to be Y for yes, we start that off and this is going to take some time so I'm going to go and make a cup of coffee and I'll be back right after that. Excellent. Our system has now been uh, bought up to date using the sudo apt series of commands. So we can um, continue now with the actual git installation. It uh, says here that you likely already have git installed but uh, they would like to make sure that we've got the absolute latest version or the most up-to-date version of git. So you can check to see that you have git installed or not by typing git minus minus version. This should tell us a version number of git if it's installed. Indeed I've got git version 2.25.1. 
they say here after the installation that the uh, the Git version that we should have to uh, continue with the Odin project is version 2.28. Uh, We've got 2.25. So yes, we will go ahead and do the um, the latest upgrade of Git. Now you may be wondering why this version already isn't up to this version of 2.28, and the reason is. Uh, is that the Git that has been distributed with the Ubuntu uh, Linux is only version 2.25 as of um, my update. So in order to um, uh, upgrade to an even later version is to use the repository of the, uh, of the developers, the actual Git developers. So in order to do that we can grab the uh, index of that repository by using this command and add that to our system. So we've now told git, sorry, we've now told apt that we can find versions of git in this particular repository. So in order to uh, push that through further, we have to run our update command again. And now that our app has been updated, we can do the final install of Git. yes we have to answer yes we do want to continue with our installation and I'll be back right after that has been completed our git has been upgraded to the latest version so we can verify this by running our uh, git version command again git minus minus version and it is reporting that we have version 2.35 which certainly is greater than the uh, required 2.28. So continuing now with our uh, configuration of Git. In order for Git to work properly we need to run a couple of commands here in order to set some things up. The changes that Git records are also stored in the cloud repository called GitHub and uh, we'll be looking at that in a moment as well. So let's go ahead and uh, run these couple of commands here. We need we need git config minus minus global user dot name, and here we enter your name. But in my instance, my name is Tony Johnson. enter. That variable is set. Then we need our next command which is basically the same thing except that it is user.email. I won't put in my uh, full email address. I'll just use Tony at and I'll use my computer name. And now those two variables have been set. Um, the note to take note of here is that Git, Git, GitHub, the cloud repository, has recently changed the default branch on new repositories from master to main. So we need to run this command here in order to uh, fix that up. Git config minus minus global. Git config minus minus global init dot default branch main. Now that's done. And to enable colorful output with git. Do we want that? Sure, why not? git config minus minus global. So git config minus minus global color American color spelling dot ui auto Excellent, so we've run those configuration commands. 
to verify things are working properly, enter these commands and, ver and verify whether the output matches what you expect it to be. So git config get, git config minus minus get user.name, I'm expecting to see Tony Johnson, great. And the next one is user email, and I'm expecting to see Tony at my computer name. Great. So now we can continue on to set up our uh, GitHub account. I'm just going to organize my screen a little bit better here. Cool. Now we can uh, move on with the instructions. First of all, uh, you need to have a GitHub account. So if you don't have a GitHub account, you need to go to github.com and create one. If you already have an account, you simply sign into your account. So I already have a, a, a GitHub account and I've already signed in. In order to communicate securely between your computer and GitHub, you need to create an SSH key. And now you can write whole books on SSH and indeed they have, but we'll just continue on to uh, follow the commands through. If you want to study up some more about SSH, please do, or uh, make sure that you do read these paragraphs that we're um, skipping over. So we need to create our SSH key. Uh, in order to do that, we need to run uh, some commands. So we'll check this command here. The first thing we're doing is to see if we already have an SSH key. So if the message appears in your console saying that you have no text file or directory, which ours does, it means that you don't have the required SSH key. So we're going to go ahead and create our SSH key. Okay. In order to do that, we run an SSH key gen command. So let's do that. SSH key gen. The type of key that we want to create is an ED25519. Minus create using your email address. In my instance, I'm just going to use uh, Tony at my computer name. Hit enter. It's asking us where we'd like to keep that file. The default is fine. We don't really need a passphrase at this point, so we can hit enter. Enter and we have generated our ED25519 key. Now we need to link uh, that SSH key that we've just created with our uh, GitHub account. So on the GitHub side, we need to uh, select our avatar, go to the settings menu. In settings, we need to find uh, SSH and GPG keys. And uh, I already have some keys in here that I use from various computers. Your, uh, your um, account should be empty at this point if you've just created a new account. And we'll add our SSH keys to that. What we need to do now is copy the public side of our SSH key up to uh, GitHub. The command in order to do that is here. And there is our public key, which has been displayed on our Linux terminal. Let's grab a, uh, a copy of our key. Here, make sure you've got the uh, entire key beginning with SSH and ending with your email address. We'll take a copy of that. We go back to our uh, GitHub account. We add a new SSH key and we can paste the key that we just copied into the key space here, making sure it starts with the SSH and ends with your email address. We can give our key a, uh, a descriptive title. In my instance, I often just name it after the uh, computer that I have my key on, and we add our SSH key. Our key has been added to our GitHub account, and the last thing that we need to do is to test that our key is working properly. In order to do that, uh, you can uh, view this article from GitHub and follow the directions in order to test your key. 
that's an exercise for you to do and it brings us to the end of this video so let's just have a, a quick recap of what we achieved initially we installed the Windows subsystem for Linux to be part of our development environment so that we can um, integrate the Linux command line with our Windows we installed Google Chrome browser and we installed the VS Code editor as graphical applications we also looked at several command line applications used uh, on the Linux command line. These are the applications that you will probably use uh, a lot. And we also um, took a look at accessing your Linux directories and files with the Windows Explorer. Finally, we updated and upgraded our Linux to the latest version of the software. And we also installed and configured Git and your GitHub account. Please remember that uh, Windows and WSL are not supported by the Odin project. Uh, that's very important, but I'm sure that there are people out there using Windows and WSL as part of their development environments. So thank you very much for watching, and please enjoy your Odin project journey.